So this is going to be a very short video, but I wanted to share something very interesting with you guys because I've been doing um, some reading most recently on um, computational slash theoretical neuroscience papers and uh, more specifically about neurons and dendrites, the spikes that happen in them. As you already know, my channel is mainly about brain waves, but I also cover other topics uh, because my passion in, is in brain waves and brain isolation, but I also, obviously, anytime you talk about anything wave related, frequency related, you can definitely expand on that as well. And so, um, this would be a little bit off topic, if you will, because we're going to talk about spikes in neurons. So when we talk about computational neuroscience, another word to call it, another AKA, um, is also uh, mathematical neuroscience. And essentially what it means is that, if you don't already know that, which you may, but essentially what it means is that uh, it differs from experimental neuroscience. So for example, for my dissertation, I did experimental neuroscience, which means that I actually ran a study with humans, with, they, I brought them into the lab. I um, poked around with them and I also measured their brain waves. But when it comes to computational neuroscience slash mathematical neuroscience, you actually don't necessarily need to do your own research, but you can work with experimental neuroscientists and then get their data and then compute stuff on that. So essentially what you do is that you take use of certain mathematical equations uh, and then you run them with different programming languages, more specifically Python, because that is pretty um, common in, this, in the field. And then you, based on the computations that you do, then you can make inference in terms of the findings. And these papers that I'm talking about were specifically uh, more geared towards spikes in neurons. Some of them were geared towards spikes in dendrites. And when we say spikes, essentially we, we mean that what we call action potential. It's, it's basically, the moment when a neuron uh, increases in action potential comes to a level and then goes down and that is when the electricity um, anyways if you want to learn more about action potential please um, google it and search for it because it's very interesting but um, uh, I don't need to repeat I, I don't want to repeat something that you may already know but essentially that's what we call a spike and the reason we can measure that is because the neuron is at its at its peak in terms of um, the signals that is in it's emanating and that is what when what we can measure we can see because we call it the spike and we can say ah oh, there's one spike here one spike there you know and then obviously you have also a group of neurons so you have a group of of spikes but the interesting part is that when you look at computational neuroscience and how um, folks do computation for neurons it's very interesting because it's not only one neuron but it could be a group of neuron and it could be just one part of a neuron it's for example just the cell of the of the neuron and then most recently i was also reading papers where they also looked at the spikes in dendrites and dendrites essentially are the ones that you look like tree and that's where you have all these synapses and you have all these connections so long story short the brilliant part with computer science or, or uh, computational neuroscience is that essentially if you have data that you have collected uh, any type of spikes with these computational neuroscience you can actually compute what is going on with those neurons slash dendrites and all that is math it's pure math and computer science because you run it on python and that's what i found fascinating 
Okay, so that was a little bit of an introduction. Now, to the gist of it is that while I was reading these papers, the beauty of it was that these um, computational neuroscientists were able to actually map what is happening in, for example, a single neuron or maybe a bunch of them, and, but also in dendrites. And the, the inferences that they had pulled as a result to these studies was that the way these neurons work in the cell, in the, um, in the brain, they are much more complicated than we initially thought. So it's not like, oh, there is an action potential because of potassium increase or whatever. Uh, and then you have a signal. No, it's actually much more um, elaborate than that because these neurons also talk to each other. And that is what got me very interested in also looking at neurons because as you may already know, most of the things I work on and research and whatnot, it's been mainly focused on the brain waves, on the oscillation, because I think that we don't have enough, um, enough research in that area. However, now that we're able to use computational neuroscience and really go into one specific neuron or one specific type of dendrite, then it just begs the question, how much more is there to, to study? Because there is a huge possibility that, that these two connect. Going back to what we've been talking about earlier, the physical brain, in this case neuron, and the non-physical brain, in this case brain waves. Now, each of these papers obviously included a lot of uh, amazing methodology and amazing, amazing uh, um, computations. Um, so I highly recommend you, you read it and I'll link them uh, below as well. But the gist of the whole thing, if you just look at it any, at an eagle eye view, the, the science of computational neuroscience is really opening up a vast, um, oppor vast field of opportunities for us to now go and compute these neurons at a physical level. And the beauty of it is that most of these, the ways in which they are being compute, com computed, uh, it uses mathematics and it uses physics. And so how cool is that? We're using mathematics and physics, and in this case also uh, computer science, to understand and explain neurons. Because I don't care who said what, uh, when you get to the bottom of it, we still don't know how the brain works. We still don't know how the neurons work. All that we know so far um, from the last hundred years that we've been doing this type of research is that we just know how a brain, the brain or part of it react to what. That, that's basically the whole neuroscience field or the whole cognitive science field because in research what we do in, in labs is that we poke the participants to do something and then we said aha this lit up so this means that this is the visual cortex cortex for example but other than that there's just so much more we don't know which brings me back to the long time question that I've had that I also recently um, saw a few of the scientists also um, talk about it is that we don't even know how to represent information slash knowledge at the neuron level, let alone at the brain waves level. We, we still don't know. And so when I was, um, when I l listened to these talks about um, quantum mechanics, string theory, black holes, uh, all of that, they talk about knowledge, they talk about information, yet brilliant scientists, yet we still don't know how to represent that. Even when you look at black holes and they're talking about the holographic um, of black holes. 
I'm sure I don't make sense at all uh, mainly probably it's because it doesn't make sense in me I just do these videos and I just talk and share things with you guys uh, whoever listens but um, these are the thoughts that I had, the philosophical thoughts that I've been having um, since I got more and more introduced to computational neuroscience. So you have math and physics at the neuron level, and then you have brain waves at the wave level, and then you have black holes, and then you have string theory and quantum mechanics. All of that somehow is connected. It, it somehow is connected because if you think about information and knowledge and how it's representing us consciousness human consciousness with the rest of the universe is just amazing so i guess i went a little bit philosophical on you guys today so i i, I really feel that part of me is scientism part of me is a, a philosopher and that's why you sometimes come to these um questions and um, in general, when I have the, these thoughts, I feel quite insecure to talk about it unless I see other people talk about it. And so I guess now I'm a little bit brave. Um, I felt a bit brave to do this video just because recently I was watching some talks from brilliant um, physicists, quantum physicists, who talked about these things, but also some computational neuroscientists but also some neuroscientists and i immediately could make that connection and felt a little bit brave to make this video and share it with you uh, until next time see you bye